Wish you were one of those influencers with raving fans who binge on your every word, consume all your content, buy everything you have to sell, and demand even more? Then stay tuned while Authority Magazine columnist and BuzzFeed contributor Tracy Hazard shares strategies, tips, and tactics from top videocasters, podcasters, authors, and social influencers on creating that bingeable factor. Now, let's join Tracy as she explores how to rise above all the digital noise with The Binge Factor. I had the pleasure of being on the other side of the microphone with this podcaster a couple of weeks before I recorded this episode, and I had to invite him back here because he has some of the most original formatting I've ever seen and heard, and he also has the most fabulous outro. I can't tell you how many people I've shared it with. So you're going to want to go check out the blog post for this episode and definitely go check out a show so you can listen for it yourself. But you're going to want to link to that and, and take a listen to some of the unique things that he's doing. So today I have Therapy Bites Art Lab, A-R-T-L-A-B, because that's how he does it. Dr. Robert Heath Meeks. And he, Dr. Doc Heath is amazing. He's got 38 years of behavioral health with a dual PhD in neuropsychology and forensic psychology. And in Therapy Bites Art Lab, they talk about the psychology of everyday life while serving up some baseball related metaphors and farm animal projective assessments. And they've got these really interesting and fun bits and puppets and all kinds of things that you're going to want to check out. I was uh analyzed by one of their uh Sigmund Freud not um so it's really interesting and fun the way that they play with the show and he's fabulous and and amazing here talking about how he builds his show with his team what they think about how they go through it and you're really going to get a sense of the creative vision that he's got going on here and how you might want to play more with your show so let's talk to the host of Therapy Bites Art Lab Doc Heath. I am so glad to have you on that side of the mic and not me not being grilled <laughs> and having some fun today and enjoying talking about Therapy Bites Art Lab, A-R-T Lab. And now it's an interesting name because your show, it sounds like it's going to be short, Therapy Bites, but it's not. And I think that's such an interesting contrast. You know, no one's ever brought that up before. You're actually the of all the people that have reviewed the podcast. No one's ever picked that out. And yes, it, I guess it's meant to be a bit ironic, but the operative term is bites because we're actually challenging our own field of psychology because we think that we have kind of gone off the rails as a profession. I think that we've got more complex and, you know, who, who, who wants that? I guess some folks are into that. I'm into nerdy, complex stuff. But it may not be helpful to people. And I, I actually just had a uh, patient and I was sharing with them that, you know, the, the definition we've come to use for psychology is telling you things that you already know in words you do not understand. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I'm going to have to share that with my psychology friends. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's something that my daughter says this to me all the time. She's like, um, every time I ask Alexa to define something, she gives me a word that I need to define again. <laughs> like, she's like, this is not helpful. <laughs> well, and, and our, our big motivation really got to be when we started paying more attention to social media. And I have a friend, his name is Richard. And Richard's in the concrete business. And Richard said, you know what, Doc? He said, in the summertime, everybody with a brother-in-law, a wheelbarrow, and a shovel thinks they're a concrete guy. Well, it's the same way in psychology. Everybody with a mic who's been through a difficult situation thinks that they can do psychology and <laughs> or, or life coaching. And I have a, a very dear friend. He's a life coach, but he has lots and lots of training. Uh, but it's, it's no, well, joke that a guy that, that graduated from the same place I graduated from uh, is one of the, uh, uh, I don't know if he created or he produces it, but uh, Roseanne, which is now known as the Connors, Jackie, who runs a diner, is a former life coach. And Chris Farley uh, from Saturday Night Live was a life coach that lived in a rundown trailer beside the river. <laughs> and so the thing is, uh, I also have banker buddies that say, you know, 
uh, you know, they call me Heath. Heath's my middle name. And they say, uh, it, it really amazes us that, that somebody will be out cooking a burger and the family will say, man, you cook great burgers. You should open a burger joint. And my banker buddy says, that's always a mistake because, you know, it, it's, it's, there's got to be more to it. You know, you, you really need to dig into the science of the burger uh, or the science of concrete or in my field, if you're going to put yourself out there, don't get your education from social media memes because that's just low hanging clickbait. And we it's have so lots true. of, yeah, we have lots of folks that come into the clinic and I'm going to step on some toes here, but this is our, these are our high value targets and why, you know, th I'll be a bit more serious though. We're kind of whimsical in the art lab, which stands for accurate, realistic thoughts life affirming beliefs art lab we study accurate realistic thoughts and life affirming beliefs we have a little character named Artie, uh and then we have another little demon like character named iud iuty that stands for inaccurate unrealistic thoughts of course and um we see so many people come in and they'll say oh my relationship is toxic is it really well you need a radiation suit <laughs> Yeah, our terminology is a little uh, <laughs> interesting. And, and so the terminology that you see on social media gets in the way of what's really going on in the brain. And the purpose of the art lab is to really tackle that. And we're taking a bite out of psychology, but sometimes it's an elephant-sized bite. And we're doing some things to kind of break it down and doing some shorts. And uh, we do a thing now called QIQ. Uh, the question in question, the, the psychologically nutritious YouTube game show. And we take <laughs> a, a, a really brief concept that someone has asked a question about, and we give the answer. Here's the answer. And of course, the audience comes up with the question. Sounds a lot like Jeopardy because we copy Jeopardy. And uh, we do that every Tuesday and Thursday as kind of a, I don't know, I guess you call it a lead magnet, but it's really a educational lead magnet. And we've had folks that'll say, you know, that was really very much needed because the longer form uh, sometimes is too long for my attention span and doing the short stuff is really helpful. And I think if there's a weak point in what we do, and we have lots of them, we try to tackle them one at a time. We don't mind having weak points. We just look at weak points as opportunities uh, for improving our stuff. And and that was a weak point that we, even us, we we toss out some things and people think, gosh, what's an RD? And what's what the IUD? What mean? Yeah. And uh, we have this whole zoo of critters, uh, emotional reasoning that, catastrophizing ant, uh, an underthinking ant, and we have all these creatures to explain these concepts, and we're going to use those, by the way, to write a children's book. We had someone ask us for a children's book of all our creatures, and we're going to do that. Oh, I maybe love Chat that GPT. That. Can, yeah, maybe uh, you could have somebody else, right? <laughs> there yeah, you go. maybe Chat GPT can help. Well, you know, you've got. It's not like you don't have your voice and you don't have your content, and you've got now all those videos. So putting them in is going to be an even better solution because at least it's not going to be some generic answer. It's going to be your answer. Yeah, uh, you can yeah. you can force the AI to at least use that. But you know, you have a really as we were talking about. It's not a bite sized show in terms of a small bite. It's like an elephant sized bite. But you have a lot of character segments and complexity to the show. But it's not overly confusing to watch or listen to. It's, oh, great. We were it, hoping it wasn't. Yeah, it just kind of flow. It, it's an entertainment mode, right? It just, I, I you know, I think sometimes we don't disrupt enough it, oh. to get the thought process in. And I think that's what your show does really well. And so when I was psychoanalyzing your show and looking for the binge factor of it, that's what I think it really is. You've allowed me to buy this sort of disruptive segmenting model of interrupting me with occasional characters or bits or other things that you do, allow the concept to sink in. So now I'm getting something out of each episode that I might not otherwise. And I, of course, then want to come back and listen to more because I, I, I gained something from that. I gained knowledge or I gained perspective. Yeah, and, and we're really hoping to uh, make it kind of like a buffet that, that we don't come into it with the expectation that every person is going to be a super fan and just say, 
oh my gosh, I just love everything. Because what what are the chances? You know, maybe if you love everything, you do need therapy. But there's going to be things that you're not going to like, and that's okay. We're okay with that because we we don't start it trying to appeal to everybody, and we know we won't appeal to everybody. I mean, what are the chances there are now literally uh, uh, a lot of people on the planet, eight billion people? That's a lot of freaking people. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I think we can safely maybe slow down on making people. We have lots of people. <laughs> um, not according to China and not according to uh, Elon Musk. But otherwise, I was so the curious. I'd like to us. talk to him about that. Uh, but I know. I think, we need to have a chat about that. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think that's something else going on there with Elon that he believes he needs to. We maybe need to, to redeploy people. <laughs> yeah, we, we need. He needs to spread his genes around, you know, and that. But uh, but but with eight billion people, what are the chances? One of my favorite stories is actually from a minister, and uh, the minister said that uh, he was he was going to to preach a sermon, uh, and it was a, a wintry day, and only one person showed up, and and it was a farmer. And the minister said to the farmer, he said, "Gosh, you know, no one showed up. I, I guess I should just cancel the service. You know, you're the only one here." And the farmer said, preacher, let me tell you something. I got a lot of cattle, but if I go out to feed my hay uh, to my cattle and only one cow shows up, I go ahead and feed that cow. <laughs> I think it's a sign. Yeah. <laughs> and and we look at it that way with our podcasting is that literally I tell my team and there, there are four of us. I'm, I'm just one of four clinicians that there is one person out there that really, really is going to benefit from our message. And my question for you guys, my my team, is that enough? Because if that's not enough for you, then we should just go ahead and quit. But if if changing the life of one person is enough, then well, let's let's do that. And then we decided that well, uh, that one person can find value in some things, and then we'll engineer some other things, more like a buffet that maybe other people can, can chime in with. And it's interesting. You should talk about your, it's called the, no offense to anyone, It's called the PMS analysis. You know, it's, it's psychomalarkey scale. You know, we're making fun <laughs> of our own stuff. So, so what Doc Heath is referring to is that they sent me because I was on his show and they sent me my analysis, which is a part of one of the features on the show. And they sent it to me so I could hear it because that episode hasn't quite aired yet. And so that way I got the full effect of what the episode was going to be like. And I, it, was so entertaining. It made me smile. And I think that that's really, really a gift that you have is that even if it, maybe I might take away of something wasn't like it didn't totally hit home, you still make me smile. Like there's still Aww. a lot of humor in everything that's done. The characters make it make you kind of laugh, the little puppets, right? It kind of, it makes you smile and laugh. So even if it wasn't a complete, like that, that landed for me, there still is an impression that you're leaving. And I think yeah, because, that that's see, really we're, important. We're, we're not trying to hit a home run. Uh, we're trying to get a base hit. That's it. Yeah. Very, Gosh, very that sounds, good perception. That, that, that sounds weird as I say it to you. We're just trying to get on base with Tracy. You know, we're just trying to get the first <laughs> base with Tracy. Yeah. It's a good thing we're friends now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my husband, your husband, my husband, my wife, your husband might take offense at yeah, that. Yeah, they might but take no, offense. But no, we're with our <laughs> listeners, we're just trying to get on base. We, we really don't expect to hit a home run. It's interesting, your comment about our outro, which thank you so much. That's so very kind, and we 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 glad you guys enjoy it. But I had a listener tell me the other day, uh, because they, they called me, and they said this to me. They said, you know, I, I like what you're doing, but I got to that Dr. Imer Freud knot thing, and I just couldn't hardly listen to it. It just <laughs> drove me nuts. Because it's a friend of mine that does it. We have two guys, both friends of mine, and one does Dr. I'm a Freud knot. You know, is this your diagnosis? I'm a Freud knot. Uh, and then we have another guy, and he does Dr. Jung, J-O-O-N-G, A, Tart. <laughs> uh, Jung at Tart. Uh, so uh, from Carl Jung, of course. And uh, we, we just think it's fun and funny, and we're kind of poking fun because our field puts too much stock in psychological assessments. We put too much stock 
in the WACE 5 Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale and the WISC Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. We put too much stock in all these pieces of paper instead of putting stock in our patients and seeing our patients as having individual experiences and being unique humans. And this is my patient or my client having their own uniquely human experience that may not, and for your listeners, I'm doing kind of a bell curve thing here. You can look it up, you know, on a bell curve, it's shaped like a bell, that we think that everybody's got to be at the very center of the bell curve. And and I think that is the problem a lot in podcasting. I, I kind of lurk on Reddit, and and it seems like people think to be successful, you have to be like everybody else. And, and that's just a huge mistake because think about this, guys. If If you're like everybody else, then either you or everyone else is redundant and unnecessary. If two right. people or two podcasts are just alike, then one of the two are redundant. Uh, find your own thing. Do your own thing. Uh, I kind of have. Bring your own personality to it, which is really what you're doing here, even though those happen to be two other people doing those personalities. Yeah. But it's still your humor. It's your direction that's making, you know, that that's guiding that. What I think is really the, what I love about the outro and what I share to people is that too often there's this coaching advice out there, right? These podcast coaches pop up like life coaches, as you put that, right? They pop up and everyone and their brother thinks they're a podcast coach. And the problem with that is, is they have anecdotal experience, right? They have their own experience and that's about it. And they don't have the data. They don't have the years of experience. They don't have touching multiple personalities, multiple different types of people to understand what was really working. And so their advice becomes cookie cutter. That's what you're saying here is that it's this podcast that looks like everybody else's that looks just like, you know, mine. And that's not the right answer for for your show, perhaps. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. some parts are. But one of the, the coaches, the podcast coaches advice is this long outro where you sell them stuff. It's like you've delivered oh. during the episode and now you get a long outro and you take two minutes or longer, whatever it is, to sell them on your stuff. And we fly in the face of that and our advice at our company, because what we've seen is that that just encourages someone to not play through your episode. We see a different oh. playthrough when you have a long outro. However, yours is so humorous that I keep listening to it because of the humor drawn into it that I didn't want to shut it off. And I think that that's such a, if you're going to do something like that, Mm -hmm. You have to do it right. Yeah. You, yeah. If you're going to deviate from conventional wisdom, do it right. Do yeah. it humorous. Make people laugh and they will and they will buy and they will listen, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's kind of well, the Well, you, you kind of have to get over yourself. And I, I, I won't call names because I respect these people, but I, I do watch podcasts and, and Instagram posts and and other social media posts from other people in the field. I really do. And, and people may not like what we do, but at least I hope they're not going to do <laughs> yeah. and go to sleep because uh, what we really did is, is took a, a, a relatively famous podcast teacher person's advice and, and and Googled and looked at what everybody else was doing and then did the opposite. <laughs> That's right. Which I think is so brilliant for what you're trying to do, though. See, and that and that's why it's working so well is because it is unconventional, but unconventional in a really effective way, not unconventional just to be different. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. the problem. It's it's unconventionally you. Yeah, that's yeah. why it's working, and because it's sustainable. Psycho, I hope so. I hope so. I, my, my, what really gets me out of bed in the morning? You know, we do this whole thing on motivation, and uh, there's guys out there, and and I respect these guys. I think these guys are great. David Goggins ha has a big following. Uh, gosh, what's it? What's it, the other guy's name? Uh, Jocko Winley has a big following. Uh, Jocko, if you listen, love you, but you're wrong on motivation. That that is psychologically. Motivation simply does not stop teaching that because that's not how motivation works. 
Uh, Jocko teaches, forget about motivation, get into this one. Well, I got news for you. Motivation is built on the back of cognitions. Discipline is built on the back of motivation. You organize your thinking, and how do you do that? Well, by what you decide to find purpose in. It doesn't matter if anybody else finds purpose in it. Don't Google it to find out how many people find purpose in this. You find purpose in it. And then because you found purpose in it, that gets you out of bed as it does me. I get up every day thinking, and I'm, I, I don't mean to sound, uh, you know, what's it called, a Pollyannish, but literally I get out of bed because I really want to help at least just one person. If just one person gets it, I'm, I'm, that's great. That's fantastic. And I get out of bed thinking that, and that motivation then becomes habit, and habit is discipline because you can look at discipline as ruts in the mm. gravel road of your brain. And the more you <laughs> that's drive an interesting in those way to ruts, think about it. Yeah, well, I grew up on gravel roads in Arkansas, uh, and if you drive on those ruts enough, well, that's that's discipline because why would you drive anywhere else? The the thing is also I wanted to add is uh, I tell my team, hey, if, if you think something we're doing is not working, critique it, you know, let, let me know. Because what, although I love being creative, we, we can, we creatives can also get into the mindset that our ideas are so wonderful, they shouldn't be questioned. And that is a mistake. <laughs> I uh, so agree, right? Because yeah, if, we we mm -hmm. continual learning is a part of everything that we yeah. need to do, right? Yeah. But you know, I want to touch on something you said before we before we kind of head into this creative side of it because it is important. But the motivation issue is the number one thing. Look, I tell my clients, I can't record for you. So if you're not going to be motivated to record, this is not something I can I can physically do for you. It's not going to happen. So we got to figure out what that is for you. And I think that's the conventional wisdom that we hear from the coaches out there are, you just have to do it. You just have to schedule a time and do it. <laughs> yes, and I, it's, it's you and I Nike both commercial. know that that is, that yeah. is a recipe for disaster, right? It's just yeah. never going to work that way. Everyone has their own internal motivations. And if we can tap into that and figure out what is going to work for you. So for me, my motivation is, I love to have these conversations, uh, yeah. right? It is way harder for me to do a topic lesson kind of episode where I'm going to teach you something than it is for me to have a conversation with someone. Uh, I learn something from every single person I talk to, and that's getting used in my, and I, I'm going to say used, it's also getting filtered, it's getting turned into something. That's the creative part for me, and that's what energizes me, taking other ideas and putting them together into something that's workable. So Absolutely. that's what gets me out of bed in the morning, as you put it, right? That works for me. So I had to really come up with a motivation that would be similar for me to be able to do the educational coaching pieces that are required in my company. So you got to figure out how you can do that. So for me, I will show up for one person. If one person's yeah. depending on me, I'm going to show up. So we had to force our topic episodes into a live stream situation so that I show up on time. I show up for whoever's going to be there. I don't know. They'll show up. And the more people that show up, the more energized I am and the easier it is to keep going and make sure that you do the next week and the next week. But I had to come up with that. What is it for you, that motivation piece besides helping one person? What, what is it for you? Uh, I, I like to be a good example uh, to my team. Mm -hmm. I like to, as they say, practice what I preach. Uh, and I don't want to be selfish. And I think I struggle with selfish, selfishness because I, I, I want to have my way because I think, well, why not? I mean, you know, look, the world would work so much easier if all you guys just give me my way. I mean, we just all get along better. If you well, that, that flies in the face of having team, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you invited the team in, which kind of pushes you out of that totally it selfish does, view, right? Does. But the other selfish thing is this, and I've told my team this. We've had this discussion a few times, and I also tell my team, I'm not like people on social media that say, hey, I love all you guys, 
How could you do that? There's 8 billion you guys in the world. You've not met them all. You might not love them at all if you met them. Uh, so I will tell my team and select people I love them. And I tell my team I love you guys. But you, But to do what we're doing, you have to get over yourself. Because they were so, and still are to some extent, so camera shy. And, and what is camera shyness? Camera shyness, and, and you guys think about this, send me letters, dirty letters, whatever, <laughs> um, is selfishness. Camera shyness is selfishness because here's what's going on. You are deciding, I am not going to serve my public because it is uncomfortable for me. I am not going to serve you guys because it's uncomfortable for me. And that is selfish. And I tell my team, nobody cares if you're uncomfortable. They just need help. Nobody cares if you don't think you're pretty on camera. They just need help. Nobody cares if you sound like a country bumpkin from Arkansas because they just need help. And I had somebody actually tell me, a guest of mine, he said, you know, Doc, he said, we just thought it was so amazing that some dude from Arkansas is doing this. And I thought, I'm not sure how to take that, actually. <laughs> I, I remember a compliment. Yeah, <laughs> I, I remember that way. <laughs> I remember doing uh, uh, clinical work out on the, well, all, all over the U.S., but on the, on the East Coast. And I was in a facility in Boston, and somebody actually looked at my feet and said, man, you're wearing shoes. I thought you were from Arkansas. I said, yeah, we, we just wear them when we leave the state. <laughs> Come to Arkansas, no one, no one has shoes. I love that. But uh, you know what? I think you're so right because I say this to people all the time. It's like the world deserves your message. So it's on you to get it out there. Yeah. And, and, it's, it, and it's, not, it's not really about building it and they'll come. Uh, it's, it's not about finding your audience and then doing it. It is finding a gap in human experience that needs to be served and serving. I saw a thing on Reddit that uh, some kid talking about it. He may not be serious. I don't know. Starting a podcast called the fuzzy tuba podcast. And I thought the fuzzy tuba podcast, I don't, <laughs> I don't a know. Fun name. <laughs> a fun name. Is it maybe it's not about tubas. I don't know. Uh, but there's somebody out there that needs to hear that. And then the market, takes care of the rest. Right. I mean, really it does. If, 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 if I heard somebody say, if you put out a podcast and, and the people that are the audience for that podcast are a thousand people and you get, you know, I don't know, 30% of that audience, that is a huge number. 30% of an audience is a huge number. Now we're not talking about 30% of a billion. Nobody has that, even Dwayne Johnson. Um, but 30% of an audience on a certain niche topic, 30%, 25%, 20%, that's a huge number. That's and way I, more I, than open rates on emails, guys. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, but this is you're right. I I mean, I I we've been talking about this recently. It's like, it's like we get some people come in and say, well, if I don't have a, you know, hundred thousand downloads a month, then, um, and then it's not worth doing for me. And I said, how many times do you speak to a hundred thousand people on a stage? <laughs> right. How are you happy if there's 50 people in your audience? What if you can do that from the comfort of your home every single week yeah. and talk to 50 people? Like, is well, worth I it? think that that, uh, I, I was, I was years ago. Now this is, uh, I got a trophy behind me. I was in amateur bodybuilding and there's a, a guru in amateur bodybuilding that trained bodybuilders who would be so particular about what they ate before the show that they did not brush their teeth because they were afraid that the toothpaste had calories. Oh God. I'm not even kidding. I'm not even making no, this I, up. I've it's, heard it's of this kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and Dan, the, the trainer, he's now passed away, but he, he was, he was a cool guy. He said, that is not a physiological problem. That is a psychological problem. And I think he's right. And it's the same with what you just said. Somebody that says I've got to get a hundred thousand downloads. That's not a podcasting problem. That is a psychological or at the very least a mindset problem right. because you ask what gets me out of bed and it, my definition of success in recording a podcast episode is quite simple, has nothing to do with downloads. 
It has nothing to do with reviews or ratings. It has to do with making and keeping a commitment to myself. That's it. If, if I record, if I planned to record a podcast episode and I indeed recorded a podcast episode, then that is a success. And some of that I get from the green mile, by the way, <laughs> you know, the Stephen King movie, I know, that movie. Yeah. It's yeah. great. Well, they, they, <laughs> they the horribly executed the guy and Tom Hanks, you know, void, you know, using Stephen King's voice said, well, uh, Edward Delacroix is dead. It, the execution, not that I believe in excuse, but execution was a success. If I execute a podcast episode, bam, that is my success. I, I'm not looking for downloads. As a matter of fact, and I'm not a podcast trainer, but I don't even really look. People say, what's your downloads? I, I don't know. Well, you <laughs> I should don't look. look at mine either. And why, I, why should and I, I own a platform that has stats in it. Like I should something? look and I never yeah. look. People ask Johnny Depp, you know, which I love Johnny Depp as everybody did in Pirates of the Caribbean. He's not watched every one of them. Never. This We hear a lot of creatives, a lot of yeah. actors, a lot of people who write and do other things. Once it's published or once it's aired, they never see it because mm -hmm. it was the act of doing it that was more critically important to them. And they don't want the end result to, I, I don't know if it's ruin it or adjust that view for themselves because they want to keep in what that felt like. Uh, and I think that's a really yeah. interesting model. That's how I always... I mean, my team as I, I, they'll say, don't you want to listen to it? I was like, no, no, I trust that you edited it. Right. I mean, you didn't make a mistake. So yeah. I trust that that's there, but I lived it. I was here. I was in the moment. And that is way more important to me than how it sounds on the mm -hmm. other side, technically. Right. And even if you do listen to it, you're not listening to it with the ears of your audience. You're right. listening to it with all the jungle of thoughts in your own brain. And an example I would use was one used by a famous uh, 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 psychotherapist, Irving, Irvin Yalom. Lots of great books out there by Yalom. And Yalom did an experiment where he did a psychotherapy session and he wrote down his perception of how well it went. <laughs> and he asked his patient to write down how well they thought it went. And here's the results of his little anecdotal study is that the sessions that he thought he was psychotherapy Superman, the patient thought they sucked. <laughs> I love and the that. Sessions the that his and the sessions that he thought sucked, the patients thought were the best sessions ever. <laughs> That is so, I mean, perception, I always say this is that brand, we put our brand out there, we put our message out there, but it means nothing because mm. it only means what it's perceived as. That's and right. We don't get that enough, and, right? And, and you cannot, I, I use this with patients sometimes when in relationship therapy, you do not know what ice cream tastes like in the mouth of your spouse. Hmm. Even if you do the whole French kissing thing, you don't know. <laughs> you you can never know their experience. Their experience is their experience. And and, and it, we're actually engineered that way. The creator of the universe made it so that we are unable to know the experience of another person uh, without communicating about it, which is why, you know, I, I look forward to developing a community. And we're already hearing from people that are saying, hey, I've tried everything. I've I've done all the psycho babble stuff. I've gone to woo woo clinicians, and none of that works. Uh, I'd like you to share with me what what episode can I start on? And I'll never see them for therapy, but this episode, which is absolutely free, might change their life depending on how what they choose to make of it. Yeah, so 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 important. Well, I want to step on uh, because you have an interesting show, as I pointed out. It's very complex and it's different in the way that it's structured, and you have a team. So tell us about kind of the preparation process and what uh, how a show comes together. Well, uh, I I don't have hypergraphia, uh, which is a a disorder where someone keeps grease pencils in their shower. <laughs> and then they write down ideas in the shower, but I'm close. Uh, I have Apple notes on my phone. And uh, I also have a really, really expansive, healthy, what I might call a Zygarnik radar 
and and the zygarnik effect in case you guys haven't heard of it is i left the house and the toaster oven's on oh my gosh did i leave the toaster oven on did i lock the doors that's the zygarnik effect and so ideas will will add weight to my brain until i write them down which i, will I do didn't it. know that that had a term but that's me too yeah. So we're now in my in my company here, we're addicted to Dropbox Paper, which is our collaboration tool, which is like Apple Notes, but it, we use it in as a co oh, wow. company here. I've never heard of it. And that. it's like a brainstorming document and you just like wow. type into it and you can That's assign awesome. things and to yeah, the team is like loving it. And it works for the creatives and the the to-do list people. Yeah. So it's covering both at the same time, <laughs> which is important. Well, I have a I have a really weird thought about this that that I, I've shared with my team very hesitantly because I too do not want to be fitted for a straight jacket <laughs> but I've shared it with them and they seem to do okay with it but I don't believe that these ideas belong to me I believe that these ideas for whatever reason I get them and I'm doing a disservice by not writing them down so I don't self-censor I'm so glad you said that because I've actually said that places before. And I honestly thought someone was going to say, oh, that's a little crazy. <laughs> like, I really, so, like, I don't if know. They like tell a, me how crazy I say. Uh, it's like a, you, a transmission you may be download. Right. <laughs> yeah. I may just be the lunatic you're looking for. That's I'm, I'm right. channeling Billy Joel, of course. That's right. One of my favorite songs, actually. <laughs> uh, that, that's my response. You're crazy. You may be yeah. right. I may be crazy. I might just be the lunatic you're looking for but no what one of the biggest enemies of creativity is uh, self-censoring and yes. and we really do have a filter it's not a bad thing because you know some ideas will drive a car off a cliff and that's never a good idea but i think you just have to be open to any idea it's kind of like brainstorming i tell my team you cannot write and edit simultaneously you got to mm -hmm. pick one you write first and then you can edit later. Yes, I'm not a writing coach. Some of you writer coaches can disagree with that's okay. But you write first because you're actually doing that through a different mental network than editing. Right. Then you can engage your editor and, you know, cut out all the good stuff. I would say that, I don't know, 98.6% of the stuff I come up with is crap. But then I watched Jack Nicholson, who is Sunglass Jack, by the way, on Instagram. You guys, if you're not on Sunglass Jack, just just follow Sunglass Jack. You know, really, it's just amazing, Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson. But one of his early things, he said, uh, and I can't do a Jack Nicholson. He said, he said, I write things, and then I read them, and then I wad them up, and I throw them in the trash. <laughs> And then I go in the trash and I pull them back out because it's really good stuff. So that's a, that's such an interesting idea. The way that we do it and have always done it because I, I, I'm a designer first, like a oh. product designer first. And so we always, we called it like a, like a card discard pile. So you would, you would be, you know, putting ideas in your hand, like car, playing cards. And sometimes you have to discard them. But that doesn't mean you don't reshuffle the deck and bring them back. You're not actually trashing the idea. Yeah. You're just discarding it for now, and it might come up to a better time. Well, I just want to take the reason. cream of the crop. I have a whole, you know, I, I have a whole vessel of, I don't know, milk or whatever your metaphor wants to be. But then the cream, we try to All skim right, so that right. off. And uh, I actually, I did have a writing coach for a while. Very wonderful lady, uh, Martha Alderson. You guys look for a writing coach, Martha Alderson. Wonderful gal. And uh, I asked Martha one time, I said, gosh, you know, I had this really great idea, but I think I might want to save it for later. Martha said, never do that. Uh, use your best ideas. Save nothing. Put your best ideas out there because then that leaves room for new best ideas. Uh, and it gets back to the self censoring. That's a really good important point. Yeah. But you know, I think the I other paid her thing big is money that, for that. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> but you know, the other thing is with the team, though, as we were talking about ideas and perception, right? The when you're collaborating with your team and putting your ideas out there for them to view, they when they come back and they they read it to you. So I never edit mine. I let we edit it as a team, so that th their perception of what I wrote down might be, oh, I hadn't thought of talking about that topic in that way. But now that I hear that you think that's a need, 
oh, that's really, I'm glad my idea triggered that. And so we, it morphs into something new sometimes when you leave it there and let that team perception help you refine it yeah. because I'm oh, not the yeah. audience, right? I'm not the listener, yeah. as you pointed out. Yeah. Well, as a team, we do a different way. We have a couple of different types of shows. Uh, we're about to do a bit of a psychological thriller show in a serialized fashion from our own quirky, whimsical, psychological uh, side of things. But that's coming up next month. But for now, we do an interview show, which is what, what Tracy was on. And I encourage them to look at the person's bio and come up with questions they think will be interesting. And then I make a list of questions. And if I get to them, I get to them. If I don't get to them, I don't get to them. They're, they're just almost kind of a backup. And if they're all there, which, you know, we, we all have full clinical schedules. We all always can't be there. Uh, if, but if they can all be there, we just kind of do round robin. And since they're kind of camera shy, I'm sitting there, uh, you know, under the camera, you know, kind of, you know, you, you take number four and you take number five and you take number six when I'm not on camera. And then they kind of make it their own and ask the question. Now, if it's just a, a art lab team show where it's just us, which we're going to start doing more of those. I'm glad because they're fun. Well, that's because just people ask for them. You know, I had people complain uh, and I love complaining because it's just information. By the way, you podcasters out there that are so sensitive that you don't think you can suffer complaints. Get over it. It's just <laughs> here. Here's a new word for complainers. Uh it's a it's a four dollar word. My dad would say it's a four syllable word. Information. That's it. That's all it is. Somebody complains. It's information. It's information you didn't have. Ignorance is not bliss. You're better off just knowing. If somebody didn't like it, what's what what's wrong with with knowing? You know. So we had a complaint that hey, I thought we were going to hear you, and we heard some person from Timbuktu, and we have no idea who they are. Uh, we'd rather hear you. So we're going to do one week an interview one week a team uh, show, which is really, we just take a topic and they kind of prepare on their own about their take on it. Uh, I encourage them to challenge me. I encourage them to be devil's advocate because if I, if I think I know what I think I know, I ought to be able to put my money where my mouth is. Yeah. And absolutely. if I can't do that, then I'm rude to think my thinking, but that's our two different types of shows. We create individually on our own. And then we get together and have a conversation. You know, and this is something that just I think is so critical. I, I'm hearing this again and again from a lot of podcasters that they're doing more what I what we call topic based shows or shows that are themselves speaking. And it's resonating more with their audience. They're finding a playthrough is, you know, almost complete. They're finding that those episodes have a higher listen rate. So they're binged on more often. So I think that's really interesting that you want to bring both in. And I think it's, it's going to be really good for you. I hope so. We're, we're going to leave the interviews as a longer format, about an hour. Uh, if it gets over an hour, we tend to split it into two episodes. We had a couple of shows that were I don't know. We it just they had the time. I had the time. It wound up being an hour and a half. And we're not Joe Rogan, not trying to be Joe Rogan. And so it chopped it in half and made it a two parter, just mainly as an experiment, but most of an hour. And then the uh uh the the art lab shows with just the team are gonna be more like 20, 25 minutes or something. Yeah. No, I think that's a that's ideal for you. But the other thing is, we touched on this before. You were saying like, there's so much of social media. There's so much of this stuff that's just out there, uh, you know, leaving an impression. And if we're not brave enough to put our put our thoughts out there, our actual thoughts out there, our ideas, our uh, analysis of things, our our perspectives, right? If we're not if we're not confident enough to do that, then the chat GPTs of the world is only going to have one sided information. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, chat GPT. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, a lot of misunderstanding in that. And, uh, but, but chat GPT has human brains behind it and it's only as good as its input. And the term that I heard back way back when in the eighties, when I was going to be a systems analyst, uh, for computer systems, uh, was GIGO, uh, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. 
Yeah. And that's Chad GPT. It's only as good as what you program into it. And so uh, we will probably use that, but we will also make it our own. And and I, I don't know. I, I don't know as much about it as I should, but I think it may be a starting point for those who have trouble generating ideas. I, I could I could start podcasting now with an episode a week or two episodes a week of everything that's in Apple Notes and not get it done if I live to be 300 years old. <laughs> that's my list too. So I totally yeah. get you there. Like I'm not, that I don't need it. I, I don't need yeah. it to make ideas I don't, I don't, for me. I'm good. I mean, I, yeah. I, I sometimes want, I mean, it sounds crazy, but I sometimes want the ideas to stop just so I can go to sleep because <laughs> if I have an idea and it's two 30 in the morning, I just think I, I might as well write it down. Cause I'm not going to go to sleep till I write it down. Um, uh, I, I get a lot of ideas. If you guys are wondering about how to kind of stimulate creativity, uh, a couple of quick ways. Uh, one is uh, cardiovascular exercise. I get more ideas when I'm doing my thrice weekly 5K, uh, which, by the way, I can now do in 20 minutes and 29 seconds. Uh, my Congrats. thrice weekly. Thank you. I've been working at that for a long time uh, because it just stimulates such blood flow to the brain. Uh, I'm not trying to do a few different things at once. I'm just making my feet move and I'm just focusing on my breathing because if I don't breathe, I pass out. No one wants that. Um, and so do cardio. Uh, the other thing is, is learn uh, some mindfulness meditation. Uh, the other thing is to stop self-censoring. Another thing is, and I know this sounds crazy and if it's not your thing, it's not your thing. That's okay. But there's actually some research out there that science fiction can stimulate creativity in your own segment, in your own field, sci-fi. Of course, I'm a big Trekkie, big Star Wars fan. And then also quirky quotes. Uh, quirky quotes, if you'll just sign it for a qu quirky quote, I don't know, feed or whatever, quirky quotes you'll find are the kindling of continuous creativity. Uh, they may mean nothing to you in the in the in the beginning, but they can stimulate uh, creativity and you'll never run out of ideas. But once you start self-censoring, your brain listens to the self-censoring and it feeds you less data. You're literally telling your brain, don't give me more stuff because you keep telling it it's not good stuff. I'm open to everything. Well, you know, I, I so agree. I think that self-censoring is something that we, we do too often and it makes for like, I have learned on the mic here, there's editing. Like I don't need to self-censor now, <laughs> right? Like, let me ask that question. If it turns out to be a dud, we'll fix it on post, That's right? right? Like, you know, but not going there is one of the worst choices you can make Yeah, because yeah. your audience would be sitting there going like, why didn't she ask that question as a follow-up? Like you, they're yelling yeah. at you. And so that's not a good thing when you stop yourself. Uh -huh. I think the important thing is, is being, have a vision. Um, uh, and, and, and be genuine to that vision. And then when finding your audience you really look, they're really looking for the same thing. You're really putting a vision out there as a bit of a vision magnet for others that may see things the way that you do, or they think, wow, why would somebody look at it that way? And they want to try to see things the way that you do. And you're really becoming a vision magnet. But by the way, there's a, a, a shock jock host who's passed away now. Uh, maybe not everybody's favorites. Uh, once upon a time, he was my favorite. I just thought he had a cool voice. Rush Limbaugh uh, from Cape Girardeau, Missouri, of all <laughs> places, his hometown. I thought but he was Rush, Southern. I'm surprised at that. I thought he was from the South. I don't know why. <laughs> well, Cape is kind of the South. Yeah, it's not too far from here. I used to do clinical work up there. But Rush would say, you know, don't don't be, my word's not his, don't be a milk toast. Don't straddle the fence. He said, no one wants that either be all this way or be all this way. And that's kind of, people are just looking for that extreme opinion these days, but having done that, I, what I believe just for myself is that, uh, I need to welcome disagreement and I'll get on social media to stir stuff up. And I call it social media smackdown and I will take head on 
some of this low-hanging clickbait psychological mumbo-jumbo that's put out there. And then people come on there and tell me I'm nuts, I'm crazy, and I should read some books and get updated in psychology. And I'll say, fantastic, come on the podcast. We'll put a camera in your face and a mic at your mouth, and we'll have a live debate, and I won't edit anything you say. I promise I won't. No one's ever taken me up on that, by the way. I've only had one. Have you really? I've wow. only had one in all the time where I disagreed with him wholeheartedly. And I said, I will have you on my show and I will not edit it and I will keep you on. And only one person took me up on that. How'd it go? I I think it was really one of my better episodes, to be wow. honest with you. I mean, I think I still think his viewpoint is really off, but I yeah. think it was the contrast of seeing the two of us talking about uh-huh. it from those perspectives that really highlighted why I think he's so yeah, off in yeah. what it is. And so yeah, I, think I, th- I it's think it's good. People are, I don't know, it, it really amazes me, you know, not, I'm, I'm not going to get political, but in our country that we have, have devolved in such of a vanilla type of conversation that if I say something that doesn't agree with your beliefs, I'm toxic. Or if I say something that challenges what you're saying, I'm gaslighting. And and that is just the death of free speech. That is just the opposite of the Bill of Rights. Now, I believe in being courteous. I was raised that way. But if, if, if I don't have the right to speak my opinion, eventually you won't have the right to speak your opinion. So I want you to speak your opinion because you're doing it is protective of me having that freedom also that so many countries don't have. One of my favorite quotes comes from, a, well, I think it's World War II, where a, a, a man was writing, uh, and I can't, I, I can't quote it exactly, but he said that uh, they, they came for the Jews, and since I wasn't Jewish, uh, I, I kept my silence. I didn't speak up. And then when they came for this group, since I was not part of that group, I did not speak up. And then finally, when they came for me, there was no one left to speak up. Mm -hmm. And so I think even if I have a show and I have our own opinions and things like that, I am fully welcoming of other people coming on the show and even doing stuff, which I think is just some of the weirdest stuff I've seen, bless their heart. And I, and I'm I'm sitting there, you know, being courteous, but I find value in that because that is their human experience. And the highest calling as a human is to be a human and to be a fully present, genuine human in your space of humanity. And I, I think that's the great thing about podcasting is it gives so many people a really, really economical way uh, to just, you know, experience their humanity. I'm going to leave it right there because that is, I think, exactly what your show is providing and exactly what you're bringing to the world. So, Doc Heath, thank you for bringing Therapy Bites to the world. Thank you for airing your voice every single week and the voices of others. And thank you for all the work you do. It's been a pleasure. So I almost felt a little like weird psychoanalyzing a psychoanalyst, right? (laughs) Exactly. But it was a lot of fun to really talk about um the show from different perspectives, from how you're building it to how you're creating it, to how the vision for it, to how it's feeling and being received by people, right? The psychology of that as well. Um, But I really am so pleased that the direction that this episode took was really mostly about motivation. Because at the end of the day, that's the one thing I can't make you do. I can get you all excited about the world of podcasting. I can give you all these fabulous podcasters who you want to model and and build your shows like or learn from, add a tactic that they've given you. I can give you every tip under the sun in my other podcast, Feed Your Brand. I can even do production services and all kinds of things in my company, Podetize, for you. But I can't make you record. I can't make you sit down to this microphone and give us your message. I can't make you interview great people and bring us your connections if you're not willing to reach out there and ask them to be on your show. That motivation has to come from you. And Doc Heath found a motivation for himself. He is passionate about this. You can see it lights him up. He loves it. And that makes all the difference in the fun and the effectiveness of this show. So I told you, 
don't forget to go listen to the show. Check it out. Go all the way through and listen to that full outro because you're going to laugh out loud and have a lot of fun. And be sure to link back to thebingefactor.com. Check it out. And I'm going to link back and forth between the episode where I was on his show and he was on mine. So you can see what it looks like when you do a podcast swap and how effective and interesting the two pieces can be. Because I knew more about him as I'm interviewing them here, I think it makes for an effective interview between the two of us. So be thinking about that as one of your strategies, doing one of these podcast swaps and check out how effective that was. So thank you all for being here on The Bitch Factor, for listening to my great guests and for checking out and being curious and intrigued by the podcasting industry. Thanks everyone. I'll be back next week with another Binge Factor. You've been listening to the Binge Factor Podcast. For more information on podcasting and video casting success tips and tactics, please go to thebingefactor.com. And be sure to listen to our other show for podcasters called Feed Your Brand. If you'd like to be interviewed on this show, as well as featured in Tracy's column, please go to thebingefactor.com slash guest and apply. 